Well, what a geochemist does in the woods is entirely his own business. <laughs> You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast, brought to you by the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. I am your host, Marissa Lowe, joined by my regular co-hosts, John Penny Fisher and Elliot Carter. Hello. And our two special guests slash joining our team of hosts this week are Peter McArdle and Arthur Goodwin. Hey. Hello. Hello, thank you both for joining us and I suppose welcome to the team. So Hello. Peter uh, started his PhD here at Manchester in October, I believe, uh, so just last month. Um, and then Arthur started last October, so. Uh, last January, up. actually. Oh, last January. Enough. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you delayed it. I'm a sort of in between, but no. Ah, uh, okay, well, what is time for the past year anymore? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, how are you both doing? Thanks for, thanks for joining. Good, thanks, yeah. Um, enjoying Manchester. I, I had never been here before, before coming to do the PhD, so. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're very excited to have you on the team and, and hopefully to all you at the audience, we'll see a lot more of uh, Peter and Arthur as, as the weeks uh, go by, as uh, as our team uh, ever expands into uh, a semi-competent bunch of uh, podcast hosts. I can try. <laughs> Emphasis on the semi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's by no means goodbye to everybody else. It's just, um, you know, we thought it'd be, it'd be great just to get a few more people on, on the team and, uh, and to help out with episodes and stuff. So, yeah, a big welcome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I guess as Marissa just said, you know, you're both, uh, you, you both have started. So maybe, uh, maybe it'd be cool just to sort of get a picture then of what kind of things you'll be studying in your, in your PhD over the, over the next few years. Yeah, I can start if you want. So um, my project is very loose. It's about looking at organics, preferably in Martian meteorites or terrestrial analogs. So um, I look at a meteorite which is called Black Beauty. So it's quite unusual. It's actually a, a near surface piece of the Martian crust which has been blasted off and last landed on Earth. So um, it's yeah, we got some very it's very very expensive. But it's so rare, so we got tiny tiny chips of it, and we're gonna try and three D scan them, maybe cut them open and see what's inside. So it's early days, so yeah, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. What, what kind of thing can you find out from organics in, in meteorites? Yeah, so it depends how you phrase your question. So I'm from an astrobiology background. So Ooh. I guess okay. one of the things I'm asking is either, is it derived from life? Is it proof of life? Which I don't think I'm ever going to prove. But the other hand, you can say, is there organics on Mars? Is it habitable? Is there the building blocks of life there? Which I think is something to be answered much more. Clearly. That's really cool. So what, what kind of astro bio uh, background did you have? Is it, was that from your undergrad or? No, that was actually from my master's. So okay. my undergrad was with um, Exeter Uni slash Camelon School of Mines. So it's very mm -hmm. practical. Um, yeah. Very traditional geology, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I moved on. I was at UCL for a year doing planetary science and masters. Yeah. And that's when I picked up astrobiology. I was working on stromatolites and origins of life. Mm, so, um, cool. That's sort of where that's drifted over then into looking for organics and stromatolites into looking for Mars. So that's awesome. So yeah. I, I guess it might be good because I guess uh, stromatolites is something we've never really chatted about on the podcast before. So I guess um, my understanding of stromatolites is that they're these very ancient bits of life, I guess. Yeah, that's that is the debate. So um, stromatolites are basically just laminated wobbly wobbly rocks and the question is whether that wobbly wobbliness is because of microbial mats mm -hmm. so basically just slimy green algae which has built up these layers over time or whether it's just chemical physical and natural things occurred without life yeah. influencing it so um all the historically they were like yeah that's a stromatolite that's evidence of algae that's life and now as we sort of realize how complex chemical systems can be with suddenly like actually we're not no. sure anymore so um, it's one of those cutting edges where we're still mm -hmm. what we are need is those, um, um, sorry go on. um are they those like dome shaped things i think i've seen pictures of them from like australia are they those yeah 
Okay. So there's currently in, I think, Sharks Bay in Australia, there's living schmatolites. So um, mm. the only reason they're there is because the water's so saline and so inhospitable that there's nothing to eat the algae, so it will form these mounds. Obviously, mm. two billion years ago, algae was all there was, so schmatolites were everywhere. So, um, but yeah, there's, they're, they're very rare nowadays. Yeah. So basically what you want to find is stromatolites on Mars then, I guess. Yeah, so um, that was what my master's was on. So I've got, I've, there's a paper that's come out in January. It's in preprint at the moment, which is on that subject, looking at these stromatolites I was studying and whether they are comparable to Martian rocks. Oh, brilliant. So how, yeah, that's excellent. So I guess, but presumably that's all like spectral data then you're using to sort of try and identify this, or, or is this based on rover information? <sighs> So it's comparing it to rover information. So rovers aren't great because their resolution's not amazing. They can look at large scale features and maybe centimeter scale and stuff with their um, camera units. And that's why schematolites are really interesting because schematolites are big. We're mm -hmm. talking early earth, everything's single cell, very small. Schematolites are evidence of very small things, but at a scale we can see. So that's why we want to look them on Mars because we can look at them on Mars. So, yeah, well, oh, that's awesome. I'll jump in then and, and give you my project. Mm. So the, the title of my project is Age and Halogen Budget of Enigmatic Incitite Chondrites. So, <laughs> so what does that mean, right? I'll be <laughs> working like 12 things on, to define there. Yeah, I'll be working on incitite chondrite meteorites, and they're famous or important because it's generally believed that they are some of the material that would have... Um, been used to build up the inner planets, so like Mercury, Earth, Mars, Venus, perhaps as well. Um, but in particular, we've got um, we've compared the isotopic systems from these meteorites with Earth's isotopes, and very very similar signatures. So it's a strong piece of evidence that they're closely related. Um, so yes, that I'll be working out the age of these meteorites, which should be incredibly old, but over four point five billion years old. And um, also working out the volatile content, that's where the mm -hmm. halogens come in. Um, and I suppose that's leading on to thinking about where did the volatile material come from, from for the inner solar system, like Earth's oceans and atmosphere, and yeah. where, where did that come from? So Yeah, oh, that's really cool. Very what cool. kind of um, age systems are you going to look at? Um, it'll be argon, argon, and mm -hmm. rubidium, strontium. Yeah. Um, and we're working on a particular type of sulfide mineral, which is very unusual which um should contain both of those um yeah enough to work with both of those systems so i guess that's that's the only thing i really know about in like chondrites the, the fact it contains all these really weird minerals you never really see anywhere else because i well correct me if i'm wrong but my understanding is that these things are so reducing that even your sort of uh, major rock forming mineral uh, elements like sort of magnesium and iron and all that kind of stuff preferentially goes into these weird like sulfides and things like that is that is that the case yeah that, that's exactly right so there's a I, I have been told that um when people are used to looking at the other chondritic meteorites when they see an instite chondrite it's like whoa what the hell is that <laughs> um so yeah a lot of it is um sulfide minerals and some of them are extremely rare anywhere else apart yeah. from these meteorites there's also a lot of metal um mm. metallic components so when I'm working with um, microscopy, a lot of it will be reflected light um, yeah. because of all those opaque phases. So. Yeah. No, they're really, I mean, they're really cool rocks in that regard, aren't they? Mm. Such, a, such a unique set of minerals you see in them. Because what's the famous one? Is it what is the one you'll be, you'll be looking at that I know that um, um, you know, your boss Trish has been working a lot? Is it DJ Fisherite or Jer Fisherite, isn't it? Jer Fisherite, yeah. It's after a guy who I think his name was D. Jerome. Fisher, yeah, um, and that's Jer Fisherite. Because um, I, I always find that mineral amusing because it's also my father's initials as well. He is oh, DJ Fisher. Wow, <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah, very unusual. So, um, but th this particular mineral also occurs in in rocks on Earth. So, for example, they're associated with kimberlite and diamond oh, diamonds okay. and kimberlites, okay. which is yeah, again, quite unusual. Um, so. Yeah, quite cool. So you're going to be irradiating those? Yes, yeah. I did, I did halogens for a PhD, so okay. I, lo I love a halogen. <laughs> Do you really, though? <laughs> it's been a long time, so, you know, the, the wounds have healed. Yeah, would you prefer a halogen or a noble gas? Uh, I think a halogen. Yeah, I'd probably agree with you there, yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks. <laughs> Apologies to any Noble Gas fans in the audience. I, I know no, you're I'm not saying I don't like Noble Gas. I'm just saying. Wow. We've two. just alienated half of our audience, guys. <laughs> Thousands of Noble Gas. Chew chemists yeah, it's, spitting it's, in disgust. It's the only reason people tune into this podcast <laughs> for the Noble Gas banter. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, but of course, Peter, so but I guess you've had a bit of an interesting career beforehand, I suppose. So you were working in the oil industry, wasn't it? Yeah. So taking a step back, I finished my, I did my undergrad at UCD in Dublin. Mm. Um, and I, that was, again, a very sort of general, broad geology degree. Yeah. Um, and at that time, I was sort of split between two, two different paths that I was considering and one was to stay in academia and do a planetary science PhD and the other was to leave academia and go into industry at least for a while and um, do, do something else and I picked the, la the latter one at the time because I'd figured okay I've been in in um, I've been in education since I was four um, it would be nice to to not be able to say that anymore and go and do something else yeah. so yeah so I went to Aberdeen to do a MSc in petroleum geoscience mm -hmm. and then subsequently worked in the oil industry for nine years yeah based in uh, in the Aberdeen area then in Aberdeen yeah, yeah. so um, yeah I've done a lot over those years exploration development operations um, I've been a team leader as well so yeah no, yeah, that's, that's really that's really cool. I mean, um, so I, I guess the, the main question, I guess you, you must get asked all the time. Then I suppose is, you know, what what drew you back into the world of academia? Yeah, and the the, the way to answer that is two parts. So one part, as I said, I was I've been interested in planetary science for a long time, and that sort of toying with the idea of being in academia I've had that for, for many many years and um, so that's always been in, in the background and the other part um, yeah so I've been in the oil industry for nine years and when I joined it was at you know the peak of the oil prices really really great um, situation yeah. being. but it's changed an awful lot since then and yep. um, the oil companies globally have been challenged um, yeah. as a result so I was I was just thinking forward. Where do I see myself if I've maybe thirty years left of my career? Um, and I I came to the conclusion that it would perhaps be tough um, to stay in geology in the oil industry for that time. Not impossible. I'm sure people who really want that will will do it. But um, given that I had the other interest in planetary science and academia, I thought, yeah, this is my this is my moment to. Yeah, to, to break and yeah. I think it's very sensible, really. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, definitely, it's not the boom times that it was. I mean, you know, I finished my undergrad in uh, two thousand and eight, and yeah, I mean, a lot of my cohort went into the oil industry, and you know, a lot of them, including a very close friend of mine who for a very long time worked for an independent um, oil company in North Wales, and they've since left because it's just such hard times now, isn't it? Particularly for the independent yeah. companies. Yeah, and I guess there's like an increasing push of like we need to leave it in the ground as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there were good years. I mean, I learned a lot over that time. Met lots mm. of great people, and you know, the company I was working for was very interesting. And but yeah, I, I thought it was a good time for me to do yeah. something else. So were you out in the field then a lot, um, doing uh, sort of lots of exciting field work? Not really. <laughs> Not much. I, I did. Um, I did go out a few times. Um, um out to the oil rigs when we were drilling and um, oh, cool. that was interesting yeah i've never been on a producing platform but i've been on mm. the drill, drilling ones but that's cool yeah it's um it's a big job to get out there you have spe really specialist training and um, yeah. you know preparing for a helicopter crash in the north yeah. sea and you know knowing what to do and then the journey out i was way up in the north sea so it was hours and hours and you could not leave your seat and you were in a, a dry suit as well in case you crashed so it was a very interesting experience. Yeah. You weren't also allowed to carry anything because if you carried anything, it could be sucked up into the propellers. So you just walked on, you know, with your, you know, what you were wearing. That was it. Mm -hmm. So just either fall asleep or look out the window. And unfortunately, I get very bad travel sickness. So yeah. that was an unpleasant flight. And <laughs> all of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what I've often wondered about oil rigs is why people don't take like small boats out there. <laughs> or is that just not these? I guess these things are quite high up, I suppose. Um, 
Yeah, I guess, I mean, a lot of the supplies will come by boat, yeah. um, but the, a lot of the oil rigs are very high, so you'd, you'd probably rely on like a crane to pick up the stuff. But yeah, I don't know. I guess the helicopters are the one that sees mainly it's efficient and quick, and it's, I suppose it's less weather dependent. The seas can be very rough out yeah. there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how have you found the, the transition then from industry to academia or um, back to study as well yeah so I'm I've benefited from the fact that I have been I wasn't working for the month several months previous to coming to Manchester so that gave me time and space to to dig out my old lecture notes and you know buy a few right. books um, and I was I immersed myself in that for much of the summer so I, I felt I felt like I was prepared then when I came and yeah, I found it absolutely great, refreshing, exciting, lots of nice people, interesting work. Yeah, yeah. very early days yet, but um, yeah, but it seems really good so far. <clears throat> yeah, the bad times will come. Yeah. Um, Arthur, did you go straight like from bachelor's to master's to here? Because I remember you mentioning you did some sort of like forestry school, forest. Ooh leadery stuff at some point yeah so um during my, my undergrad which was down in Cornwall I was volunteering at a forest school and then ended up they offered me a job so I stayed there Ooh, and then cool. I went from BSc to master's straight through and then was like right I've, I'm fed up with being taught stuff I'm gonna go and my pizza just go and do something else for a while yeah and then that was forest school teaching and nice outdoor education so um, I did that for about a year and a half and then Covid hit and obviously it's changed a lot of perspectives and I ended up going back into academia so yeah. but I it's still I didn't really leave teaching as such because I went into another form of teaching I think yeah there's a lot of experiences I took I had a job set up in Wales to um, teach geology in the field so um, I've never oh. sort of left geology. I've always been involved in, uh, yeah. in one form or another. Oh, that's cool. Mm. What do you, I've, I've never done that sort of outdoor forestry school stuff. What what types of things do people do? So it's a bit different. Forest school is usually the names usually associated with um sort of primary school age and younger, but it's it's generally uh, just a term which means anything that lasts longer than six or eight weeks. So you keep engaging with the same people over that length of time and mm -hmm. you develop new habits effectively. And those habits are enjoying the outdoors in one way or another. So um, I was working with teenagers and uh, sort of secondary school age uh, from difficult backgrounds or children in care and people that needed, well, school didn't really fit them as such. Yeah. So we tried outdoor methods and worked really well and thrived in that type of environment. So. I, I was the, the cool guy because I did all the woodwork and the whittling and soaring things up and building stuff. So it was quite easy for me because straight away people engaged. So yeah. Good fun. yeah. That sounds good. It sounds like uh, that must be very rewarding, actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because like I said, it's it's it has to be over a certain amount of time and you can see how people progress. Yeah. And I was working with the same people for effectively four years, almost five years. So you could definitely yeah. see how all the way through children growing up the yeah. difference you made so all those yeah. relationships very nice yeah, yeah. oh it cool. must be nice to be outside so much as well yeah it was it was okay because it was based around school term meant the summer we weren't actually working it was all during through the winter and the autumn so um, there was a lot of cold days but in Cornwall the weather's so nice anyway yeah it's, mm. it's never that cold as such and when it's cold you make hot chocolates so it's good <laughs> <a win. laughs> yeah Oh, is that something you can carry on with during your PhD or like still do that part time or as a hobby or anything? Yeah, it's, it's how I want to pursue it. I, I've been getting into GTAing a lot. So teaching assistant and I'm trying to basically build my skills more of a classroom setting because mm -hmm. my, my skill set for teaching has been very um, holistic and almost non-structured. And the whole idea of forest school is it's more of a a connection and an interpersonal thing I think that's very different style of teaching to what you have at university so I'm enjoying this difference when it's learning mm -hmm. another style and just building those skills mm. Mm. 
yeah, one day I'll get back to it. But yeah. I've made all the connections. I know there are people. I'm just, I think at some point I'm just the type of be like, yeah, I need to go outdoors and cut up some trees and teach people. We'll <laughs> 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 so, see. We'll see. Well, I've seen like, you know, dance your PhD, sing your PhD, wood carve your PhD. Yeah, yeah carve some meteorites. Yeah. <laughs> you could even add in little stromatolites, couldn't you? Mm. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a very niche competition. I'm not sure how many <laughs> Yeah. 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 They'd all come out the woodwork, I'm sure. Oh, oh no. John, please, please leave. Yeah, John's actually leaving the team now. Abruptly. Replaced him. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's brilliant. Well, I'm glad. Yeah, so I guess, do you see yourself as going in sort of teaching direction more as, as your career progresses, I suppose? Is that mostly what you're interested in? Or? Yeah, perhaps. I'm not really sure. I, I've been very lucky so far to be able to turn everything I enjoy into some kind of profession. So mm -hmm. like I, said, I was volunteering in this place and it was a hobby and then it turned into a job. So um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I just sort of chase the opportunities that come. But yeah, I've got a natural teacher's yeah. voice, which is really embarrassing, but it also makes me good at teaching. So, I'm <laughs> brilliant. All right. Is there anything else? Okay. That was nice. Like, I've only heard about what you guys have done in the past in passing, like at lunch times when we're chatting and stuff. So, it was nice to actually hear more about what you've done. Mm. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, really interesting. Like... Yeah, I guess it's one of the big things that we want to try and promote on the podcast is sort of um, hearing about, you know, everyone's sort of diverse route through academia and to the point and everyone's got such a different story. And I think it's it's, it's good for you know, other people to hear about, you know, other people's journeys and that there's no like conventional route to PhD or, or whatnot. Yeah, I remember when I started my PhD, I felt like, oh, I'm really weird because I took three years out like working for a bit and then came back and that so old ancient and I am so old I am ancient but <laughs> um yeah I don't know doing this has been it's been good to hear how many people like yeah there's so many different routes that lead you yeah oh, it's good I'm... to get that different experience as well I think mm. just you can being in academia is great but it does give you a certain perspective on the world and the more you can do and the more perspectives you can get I think it just rounds you as a person yeah, I definitely felt starting a PhD, having left and come back, I had a few more, like, a bit more idea of what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. See, I guess I've, I've never had any breaks, um, I guess. No, me neither. Uh, yeah, I, I guess similar to, to Peter, apart from your interruption, you know, I've been in the education since so four, so... <laughs> yeah. I've never really thought about it that way before. It's, um, it's quite An expert quite shocking, now. really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, we, yeah. we sent John in perspective. <laughs> yeah, well, because I mean, you know, I never took a gap year or anything like that. Um, yeah, no breaks whatsoever, really. And I guess I've, I've not really had between postdocs and stuff. I've never really had huge gaps either. It's only been like the, the biggest gap I've ever had was like six months, and that was like in between um, Tennessee and, and Manchester. So I think, you should, I think you should go to the woods. <laughs> I think you probably oh. should go to the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I'll teach you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> release John into the wilds. Yeah, well, what a geochemist does in the woods is entirely his own business. So. <laughs> That's got to be the tagline. <laughs> Sounds like the tagline to an awful movie. <laughs> awful Still documentary. Watching. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's nice to hear from it. Like, it's odd. We hear so many different perspectives and different career paths. But I guess the point where you hear a lot that you start to see the similarities. Mm. Um, so yeah, like the taking the breaks. I've also learned that a lot of planetary scientists, we all have a chip on our shoulder about like maths and physics because we're like the ones who weren't quite good enough at maths to do like astrophysics. So we'll look at the rocks of the planets instead. <laughs> I, I'm one of those where people when people say, oh, well, I wanted to do pure physics, but I wasn't good enough. Like I really relate to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a failed physicist too, actually, but I'm actually very glad of that. I don't have a chip on my shoulder. So yeah. But I'm not doing physics anymore. Yeah. See, I wanted to do pure chemistry, and I'm certainly glad I didn't do that. 
and plus also you know i don't know no offense i guess but uh, organic compounds i was never a big fan of a benzene ring <laughs> See, that's what I'm looking at, but it's so old, it's distorted, so you have the fun of trying to decipher it all. Oh, fun. Oh, wow, okay. Is it not right. a hexagon, then? No, so I'm, I'm, when you get really old organics like that, they just form amorphous blobs, basically, where oh, wow. the chemistry isn't so smooth. If you looked at modern compounds and analysed them, there'd be, like, say, spectrally, there'd be lots of nice peaks identifying all these benzene rings and, yeah, different things. When it's old, it all gets mushed up, so all the peaks are smeared, and you're trying to work out what's there and what's not there. And <laughs> my understanding isn't as good as it should be yet. So, mm -hmm. well, that sounds quite fun, though. Like trying to disentangle these things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, you know it's old when like chemistry starts breaking down. <laughs> wow. Well, so we've alienated noble gases, organic geochemists. Anyone, anyone else? Yeah, it's a real stellar show this week, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we've got one more question that we do like to ask uh, all our guests, uh, in a, even more so for our, our, our new uh, hosts. Is uh, something we, we do like to ask is, um, you know, if you hadn't gone back to academia uh, and then had pursued doing a PhD, etc., um, what other sort of career uh, path do you think you might have done? Um, well, I suppose I, I, I had a very big gap outside of academia already. Mm. I was in industry, so maybe I would have continued on that path. Um, apart from that, it's hard to know. Um, nothing too exciting. Maybe like, maybe open a restaurant, be a, a teacher, a detective. Ooh. Something along those lines. I'm trying to think where you could apply um you know methodological thinking and mm -hmm. um yeah but a restaurant would be totally different than maybe that cupcake shop who knows oh that uh, sounds pretty good actually yeah yeah restaurateur by day private detective by night yeah oh, i think yeah that's yeah there's definitely an itv series there waiting to be written i think <laughs> yeah i'd watch two series of it in one night yeah, sure. yeah easily yeah <laughs> I don't know if I can top that. That sounds really good. I want to do that as well. <laughs> um, I don't know. Over, over COVID, I, I, I started up a writing business as a freelance writer, which actually okay. turned out all right. So I think it's I'm like going to doing that. Scientific writing? or Yeah, there's a lot of uh, like discussion pieces and stuff. So you see on websites sometimes, it'd be like, oh, there'll be a question, and it'll just, there's a little bio of a writer, and they just discuss it. Uh, SpaceX always comes up. There's always stuff on Mars. And yeah, it's quite fun writing about it. Yeah, that's really cool. I'd like to chase that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I don't think we've had either of those thoughts before. It's just, it's nice doing opinion pieces because as soon as you try and write like factual pieces, there's a lot of responsibility on source information and everything. But when you just say about your opinion on what Elon Musk is doing it's fine because it's your opinion so yeah yeah it's definitely something I've noticed through reading uh, opinion pieces in the newspapers uh, they'll say anything wouldn't they yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> so it makes it makes life a lot easier for the writers so I can see why people do it <laughs> yeah yeah no, that's, that's cool though that's really cool yeah 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 um well thanks again for joining us today Arthur and Peter it's been really good to chat to you about what you're going to be doing and also your backgrounds and paths to Manchester. Um, yeah, looking forward to having you join, joining us for future episodes. Uh, thank you to everyone listening at home. Uh, if you would like to find out more about the team, uh, I'll post all the social media links down below or they'll be on the end card. Uh, but yeah, I think all that's left to say is thanks again and see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.